Thanks for making Wish TV Indiana's most watched television station. Welcome to Top Story. I'm Ken Owen. A bill approved in this year's General Assembly made stalking a crime in Indiana. Under the new law, persons who repeatedly harass, hound, and intimidate others could find themselves behind bars. But in the past week, two acts allegedly tied to stalking have resulted in two deadly crimes. Two recent tragedies again point to the problems of stalking and domestic violence in our society. Detectives believe the first case was a one-sided love gone sour. Methodist minister Ron Phillips was gunned down by a former girlfriend during last Sunday morning's sermon. Police say 36-year-old Elizabeth Mayberry walked into the North Salem United Methodist Church, made her way down the aisle, and gunned down Phillips in front of the congregation. She produced a 38 caliber revolver. She fired three times, striking the minister all three times. Mayberry was subdued by an usher. Phillips died en route to Methodist Hospital. Very kind. And he was gifted that he could take this as small scripture and make a beautiful sermon out of it. And imagine that uh, anyone could have the power to take a life so quickly. A friend of Phillips says Mayberry continuously harassed the minister with telephone calls and notes on his door. Another recent victim, 40-year-old Jill Coy, was the target of death threats. Now her ex-boyfriend Bill Crawley is facing murder charges. The prosecutor's office says an order keeping Crawley away from Coy expired recently. And Coy was preparing to take new legal action against Crawley at the time she was murdered. The victim also planned to have a stalking charge filed under the state's new anti-stalking law. The victim would have come to us and said, look, I am in imminent danger. I feel this guy is stalking me. He's chasing me. I want him in jail. I am in truly in fear of my life. We would have done something immediately. Smith says the prosecutor's office did what it could to protect Coy based on the information she had provided and that it was Coy's decision to wait a few days to file charges. Is Indiana's new anti-stalking law enough to ward off potential stalkers? And are tougher laws needed to reduce these types of crimes? We'll answer these questions and more as we examine this week's top story. Joining us now to discuss in depth the crime of stalking and what's being done about it are Marion County Prosecutor Jeff Modisett, Indiana State Representative Jack Cotty, who's also a colonel with the Marion County Sheriff's Department, and Elaine Honan, a victim of stalking and really the person who uh, got the ball rolling in terms of getting this bill passed in the last General Assembly. Elaine, the bill has been law since July the 1st, right. and these things continue to happen. Are things changing, or uh, does more need to be done in this department? I think the public, the victims, need to learn more about this, that they have some tools now. The legislature has provided tools for them to use to stop the stalkers. Uh, victims need to be proactive and protective and take some action to be a survivor rather than continue to be a victim. Jeff Mata said you get phone calls every day from people who have complaints about people, worries about people, uh, and this is a very broad question, but what are the warning signs people should look for and uh, when does something cross the line from being just somebody concerned about someone else's welfare to being a stalker? Well, it's interesting. There really is a, a lethality index, they call it. You can usually see a progression, an escalation in the violence that uh, one person uh, imposes on the other person. Uh, but as you can see from the examples of the last couple of weeks, uh, that's not always predictable. Sometimes there's an explosion that occurs in the, in the course of a relationship. But certainly there are warning signs, uh, an escalation of violence going from an argument that then leads to a to a, a fighting uh, that leads to uh, more threats with direct violence, things like that. But clearly under the law that's been passed recently, and as you said, since July 1st it's in effect, it's a pattern of behavior that we look at. And if a reasonable person would feel terrorized or frightened or intimidated, and they do in fact feel frightened or intimidated, then that's stalking. And there's a progression of penalties that applies depending on whether it's with a deadly weapon, whether or not it's a repeat offense, uh, things like that. But we at least have the tools there, but that's not going to protect in every situation. State Representative Jack Cotty, you've been in law enforcement for many years, so you've seen this from both sides, from a legislative standpoint and also from the streets. Uh, the, the problem we were talking about before the program is that people feel hesitant to, to make the phone call to the prosecutor's office or call police because they feel this person is not going to harm me. We've had a relationship. He's a nice guy or she's a nice person. That's correct, Ken. And, and, and 
I try to think of both, with both hats on about what we need in law enforcement and also what victims need the type of laws we need to enact. But so many years, law enforcement felt helpless, and so many law enforcement officers wind up losing their lives or seriously injured over domestic violence and things such as this. And I believe that you can see a pattern, be it a phone call where the potential victim says, well, I don't want to do anything, things will be fine, and it leads up to a threatening letter. But at no time do they ever contact law enforcement to make a report to start that pattern of what possibly could happen in the end. But like uh, Jeff stated, there's no way you can just say nothing's going to happen, but you can try to take preventative measures as it leads up to that uh, possible violence. So the first time you get a phone call from an ex or someone who is bothering you and you feel funny about it, you should call the prosecutor's office? Well, it's, it's good to uh, come in and talk to our, our people at the intake uh, section because they have a lot of experience in dealing with this sort of thing. I think what we're also trying to say, though, is that uh, because oftentimes stalking results from a prior relationship that has gone bad, that there's a tendency by some victims to feel like this person couldn't really harm me. They couldn't really mean what they're saying. The fact is that some of these other factors indicate that they are capable of it and that one should be very perceptive and aware of the sort of circumstances that are surrounding that relationship and whether or not it might cross over into this sort of irrational behavior. Elaine, you've been a victim of stalking. Uh, for, for folks who didn't follow the story, and it was a big story last year in terms of your going to the State House and, and pushing for this law, uh, when did you realize it was a problem and what were your feelings throughout the ordeal? Obviously the phone rings once or he comes to your door and mm -hmm. you figure, well, he's just heard I'm going to uh, try to deal with the situation in right. a human way. Um, at first I thought, as, as most victims, I was in denial that he would want to hurt me and I thought it's something that I've done, it's maybe somehow my fault. But the threats, the behavior, the following, that became unreasonable to me. That that just wasn't, it, that when you break up with someone, you don't try to maintain that relationship through violence. And at that point I realized it was a serious situation. Um, and. I didn't feel free enough to do anything until he was he was apprehended and put in jail because I didn't want to anger him any any further. So once he was in jail, I felt I could do something proactive and do something to get the laws changed and help other people not face this frustration and and try to stop the death that I had read about that I had heard about. Um, well, he was calling you. He was uh, oh. he was seen outside your house. He was arrested outside your right. house, I believe. And was he not armed? Yes. At the time. Yes. Uh, when did you realize that he had crossed the line? Um, probably about six weeks after I tried to terminate the relationship. And, and while we were, I was ter terminating the relationship talking with him, he very calmly said to me, well, if I can't have you, you know no one else can have you. And it was like he had said that over and over in his head. Uh, and, and just the calmness with which he said that, and I realized that he intended to kill me. Um, and so that was a year before he was apprehended. So I went through an entire year of wondering when it was going to be that he was going to try that. And Jeff, I guess we hear the horror stories sometimes about people who have contacted authorities. We have a law in the books now which should speed up that process. But uh, what, how does this law speed up the process so that people don't have to wait a year from the time they call to the time the person is apprehended? You know, one good thing that, uh, that we added in this particular piece of legislation that isn't present in every other state uh, some have it, but that is that we don't require a direct threat. It can be a pattern of behavior that establishes that this person is doing something unreasonable and is intimidating the other person. So you shouldn't feel like there has to be an explicit threat like happened here where if, if I can't have you, no one else will, or I'm going to kill you or anything like that. If the pattern of behavior is that unreasonable, then we have the, uh, the opportunity to, to act. Jack Connie, from a police officer's perspective, uh, someone who works in the Marion County Sheriff's Department, is this law working in terms of, uh, are, you, are you finding you're getting a lot of phone calls, going out to domestic disputes, situations where this comes into play? Well, let, let me just say, first of all, can I probably receive more phone calls from my fellow officers and law enforcement prior to the last session demanding that we get a stalking law on the books because of the runs they get and their hands were tied. You get a run for some potential victim, there's nothing an officer can do. There was no law on the books. Uh, their standard answer were, we can't do anything about us, call us back if he does anything. Well, I think now, and not, not only, all these are not relationships that have gone sour. This could be someone that you work with, you have no idea, they're following you home, they're sitting in front of your house, things like this. But what you have to do as a potential victim is recognize that 
and be able to start making notes, uh, making a report to law enforcement to show that pattern. But this is something that law enforcement has welcomed for years. When we come back, we'll talk more about this issue and is the law tough enough when Top Story continues. Stay with us. Welcome back to Top Story. We're talking about stalking today, and uh, Jeff Monison was saying during the break, this is a, a shocking statistic about the number of people who have called and, and charges that have actually been filed in regards to this new law. As of a couple weeks ago, we had only filed three cases uh, on stalking, and I think that that shows you that, that a lot of people are still hesitant to come forward. They're not sure what the law is. They're not sure that they have the tools in the legal system to back them up. Uh, and we were talking also about some people are just embarrassed about being a victim of stalking. Uh, you have to get over that. Uh, you have to be willing to come in and, and, as you were saying, not let yourself be a victim. So we think that uh, more people out there probably would like to come in, would like to take advantage of this new law, but have not done it yet. But the law is on the books. We will file charges, and they need to empower themselves not to be victims. And you want to let people know that if someone feels they're being stalked, they don't have to necessarily be threatened directly to come to your office. The, the standard is that a reasonable person would have to feel terrorized or intimidated or harassed by it, and in fact, that victim does feel uh, harassed and intimidated and, and terrorized. So it's a, it's a double standard, but that's a good way of measuring it so that you know that a jury's going to say, yes, I agree, if I were in that situation, I would feel intimidated too, and in fact, this victim is intimidated. Representative Cotty, why do you think people are, are not coming forward and, uh, and filing these kind of charges? It, the embarrassment factor obviously is a factor because people don't want to say this person is, is making a, an issue in my life that I can't deal with. Well, Ken, I think like Elaine stated previously, I think most of these, not all, but I'd say 90-some percent are people that have known each other for a while and are, are relationships that have went sour, be it a girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, former marriage or whatever, and I feel that the potential victim sometimes goes overboard thinking, well, nothing's going to happen. Uh, not only do I not want to be embarrassed, but also I don't think this person would really do anything to me. And if I work with them, they would not hurt me or harm me. Well, I think by the time it gets past that point, it's too late, and they have not taken that appropriate preventative action. Elaine, we've had a law in the books now since July mm -hmm. 1st. You fought for this law. Mm -hmm. Does it go far enough? Could it be stronger? Well, penalties can always be stronger as far as I'm as a victim. I may have a different perspective than people in law enforcement or the prosecutor's office. Uh, I would want them to be picked up immediately, put to jail forever and ever. That's not going to happen in our, in our society. Um, however, I do think, as we have all said, and I want to reiterate, the tools are there. Um, I would hope that the tragedies that have garnered so much attention in the media recently would alert other victims to use those tools to do something about it. Um, but I, I do think that the law being there is good, and I think it's enough if it's used. Representative County, do you like the law? Yes, sir. I like the law both as a state representative and as a law enforcement officer. Uh, we all knew we needed to have it. I think there was about six bills filed you know, previously the last session started, and I had one of them. I sit on the courts and criminal code and where the bill came through and we voted it out to the full house. But I think we all know that we needed it and I certainly supported it. And I would, like Elaine stated, she uh, don't think the penalties are tough enough. I have a reputation. I don't think a lot of the penalties are rough enough, but reality is there. We have to work within the system. And Jeff Mata said you were expressing frustration at uh, not being able to use this law more often. Obviously, you don't like to prosecute people, but uh, people are obviously out there who could benefit from this law and uh, whose lives could be uh, made less stressful if they called your office. Absolutely. And again, it's not, it's not a uh, panacea. It's not a cure-all. Uh, and we don't want to give people a false sense of security, but we need to make sure that they know that there are tools that are available to them. If it is a repeat offense or if it's a uh, deadly weapon is used, it's even a felony under the existing law. Uh, I agree we can always make laws tougher, but let's make sure and use what we have right now. Uh, it's a new law. It's on the books. If there are any bugs in it, let's work them out. But I think that we need to give it a really good chance here, uh, and not enough people who need this law are using it currently. Talking directly to the people at home, the men and women who are mm -hmm. out there watching this program this morning, what are the things that they should look for? And we've learned this week, I think a lot of people had the notion that uh, stalking was a man-on-woman crime, but we've seen now that women stalk men as well. What are the things people should look for 
before they make the phone call to the prosecutor's office, what are the kind of behaviors that are warning signs? Well, the first thing I would say is first, uh, a pattern of behavior. All right? Now, that doesn't mean that if one incident occurs, it's not a crime. It just might be a different crime, like intimidation or harassment. But stalking involves a pattern of behavior. You don't have to wait for a direct threat. It has to be a pattern of behavior that scares you to death. I mean, something that puts fear in your heart, and everybody would agree that that's a reasonable fear. If, if those conditions are met, you ought to be coming in and talk to us. And collect evidence, too? Save well, letters, absolutely. Uh, one calls. of the things that's very helpful is a lot of people will record the phone calls that come in. Uh, answering machines, oftentimes, you can just take that, that recording out and bring it to, the, to our office. That's very helpful. Um, but, uh, and, and calling law enforcement so that they can respond and perhaps they can even catch the person if they're around your area. Uh, but there are many things that, that a person can do, but don't hesitate to come in and talk to us. Any Lane, your message to the women and the men out there who uh, may be wondering about this more than they have before after seeing this program today? Well, I think the tendency is to realize that the person who is stalking you or causing you problems is that they have a problem. You realize that they're ill. Um, and a lot of people just say, I wish they'd get counseling, I wish they'd get better. They need to realize that they need the intervention of law enforcement. Elaine Honum, Jeff Modisif, Jack Cotty, thank you for joining us this morning on Top Story. When we come back, an interview with Congressman Lee Hamilton. It's been a busy week. He'll talk about issues facing us here at home and abroad. Stay with us. It has been a very busy week for both domestic and foreign affairs, from the unveiling of President Clinton's health plan to the civil unrest in Russia. Indiana Congressman Lee Hamilton is just back from Washington this weekend. He joins us now to talk about some of these timely issues. Congressman, a pleasure to see you. Thank you. As chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, this situation in Russia has a lot of people's attention. They're trying to figure out what to make of it. Mm -hmm. On Friday, we found out that uh, Boris Yeltsin is cracking down on his opponents. Is, uh, is he in any kind of trouble over there? Oh, I think he's in trouble, but I also think he's very much on top of things. Uh, the way I see it at the moment, uh, so far, so good. Uh, a struggle between the Parliament and the President. Uh, the President stands for reform. The Parliament is against reform. The President stands for democracy. The Parliament's against democracy. The President stands for open markets. The Parliament's against open markets. Uh, Yeltsin is the person we want to back here, and uh, I'm pleased that he seems to be on top of things. What could we do as a country to uh, keep the reforms moving and keep Boris Yeltsin strong? I think uh, rhetorical support is very important now to let the world know that the United States backs Yeltsin. And I also think the aid package is crucial. It is very important now that not just the United States, uh, but the industrialized democracies indicate their support for change uh, in the former Soviet Union. Uh, those are the two things I think that are critical. Third, uh, probably is trade, but that's uh, a little bit down the road yet. For folks at home who've uh, been reading about this and can find Moscow on the map perhaps, but know a little about it, how much have things changed since the, uh, the Soviet era ended? I think uh, Russia today is a country in very great turmoil. Ideologically in turmoil, it's kind of lost its compass, if you would. Uh, economically in turmoil, Great changes there, particularly, incidentally, in the area of privatization. That's one of the very encouraging things that's happening there as they privatize their economy. Enormous changes in their uh, political structure. My own view is that Russia is going to be a country in some turmoil for years to come. We can't expect to see a nice, tidy uh, Russia within a matter of a year or two. You know, in my travels in Moscow, I remember trying to get a cab in that city. And of course the cab drivers drove around all day because they were paid by the government whether they picked up people or not. It's tough to turn that around. It is tough, but that's changing. You know, you have so many individual entrepreneurs out there now. You have some of the excesses of uh, the entrepreneurial spirit. There's a lot of corruption today, unfortunately, in Russia. But uh, change is all around, and not just in Moscow, but all through the country in the regional, uh, in the regions as well. Change here at home, the big health care proposal finally unveiled this week by President Clinton. How do you read it, and uh, what would you say to critics who say it's not specific enough, or he was not, at least, in his speech? Well, the president, of course, was not specific in his speech. That wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to present the broad principles and guidelines that will underlay the program. Uh, breathtaking. Uh, this is the most... Uh, 
most challenging program we've had in the Congress since I suspect the Social Security program back in the 30s. I wasn't there then. Uh, but it, uh, it's going to go through a long period of examination. I've got uh, areas of it that I can applaud and areas where I have a lot of uh, questions. Uh, six, eight months at least on this package. Uh, we will not vote uh, on it until the middle of next year, maybe later. Do you believe that, uh, as the President says, no significant tax hikes will accompany this package? I don't have any doubt in my mind that he's strongly committed to that. Uh, that is one of his basic premises, no across-the-board tax. And so the real question becomes, can you get savings out of the programs that we now have, Medicare, Medicaid, and all of the other health care programs, enough to pay for this? And not just can you get the savings, but can you get them in time so that you don't encounter uh, financial problems? I think that's in doubt. I think that's one of the areas we simply have to look at. Is this the fight that will define his presidency, though? If it's a, if it's a six to eight month battle, and a lot of people are pointing to health care as the Clinton issue, the thing he has to push through. Without any doubt. This is the defining issue of the Clinton presidency, this term. Uh, the economic package was important, but uh, nothing in uh, of this scope. Uh, this is the defining issue of the Clinton presidency. A lot of concerns here in Indiana, pro and con, about the North American Free Trade Agreement, the trade pact with Mexico and Canada. What are your thoughts about NAFTA? And I'm sure your phone is ringing. Uh, the unions don't like it. Other people think it's a, it'll be a boon to the economy. Uh, I think it will help the American economy. I support it. Every study I have seen indicates that we will increase wages, we will increase employment, uh, we will get growth from NAFTA. Uh, from a foreign policy standpoint, it is enormously important. It is, we were speaking of defining issues at home, it's the defining issue not just with Mexico, but it is the defining issue with all of the Western Hemisphere. The world is on the brink of a number of very important trade decisions. GATT, uh, worldwide, uh, APEC, Asia, and NAFTA. And we're going to make a choice in the next few months whether we're going to go towards an open trading system or are we going to slip back towards protectionism. I think it's an important part of that uh, choice that we have to make. The naysayers, the Ross Perot's of the world will tell you, though, we're going to lose a bunch of jobs to Mexico and the job gains in this country will not reflect those. Look, NAFTA is taking tariff barriers down. Uh, that's what it's all about. We today have a surplus of trade with Mexico of about six billion dollars. That surplus comes about even with high Mexican tariffs. Their tariffs are four times higher than ours. If you take those tariffs down, then it's going to make it much easier for us to export to Mexico. Also, companies that now have to go behind that tariff barrier and locate in Mexico in order to hit that remarkably growing Mexican uh, market will no longer have to go behind. In other words, they can stay here in this country and export. And it is in the export markets where you produce the best paying jobs. NAFTA is very much in our interest. One big qualification. There are some people who are going to be hurt. Some people will lose jobs. We will net more than we lose. But we ought to be very generous in our support of adjustment assistance, retraining, and education for those people who lose jobs. We have about 30 seconds left. We could talk all day about this. The yeah. Mideast Peace Agreement. Also, a defining moment in history. It is. Breathtaking also. Absolutely incredible to see that handshake take place. Can it work, though? I think it can work. Uh, what has happened is a psychological breakthrough in the Middle East. And now we have to uh, have a political breakthrough. That's in the process of happening. And the encouraging thing in the last few days is that in the Arab world and in Israel, you are seeing more and more support. Even some of the members of the Likud party uh, abstained in the Knesset the other day. Support is building. And our job in the United States is to add momentum for peace. Congressman Lee Hamilton, a real pleasure and honor to have you on Top yeah. Story this morning. Thank you. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay with us. That's our program for this week. I'm Ken Owen. Thanks for watching Top Story, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.